Thank you. And now Professor Galia Golan, who is a professor of Soviet and East European Studies, Emerita of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, former chair of the Department of Political Science, and currently on a sabbatical from the School of Government, Diplomacy and Strategy at the Interdisciplinary Center of Herzliya. Um, and she also had many books. The re most recent, I'll make a promotion, is one on the Israeli peacemaking since 1967, factors behind and breakthroughs, at, so, sorry, factors behind the breakthroughs and failures, which was just published. Galia, please. I hope that's okay. <clears throat> Good evening. I want to um, mention two things that have already been noted when criticizing BDS uh, or talking about it generally. I think one of the things that needs to be pointed out um, was a comment by uh, Omar Balguti, the head, uh, this, uh, one of the chairs of BDS. Uh, I saw it in Haaretz the other day in which he said that Netanyahu's policies are actually the greatest help to the BDS movement. And in fact, I think it's probably not just help. Uh, I think these policies provide a great deal of justification. The settlement building, the land expropriations, house demolitions, restrictions on, on travel, and in short, the occupation. And I'm not even mentioning the nationality law and other anti-democratic legislation that has been proposed. I don't think BDS comes out of nowhere. And I don't think that all critics of Israel are simply anti-Semites or maybe trying to get the Muslim vote, which is something I heard yesterday from our prime minister. I'd like to know how many Muslims were voting in Europe in 1980 when the European Council issued the Venice Declaration. The second thing I wanted to point out is that generally BDS, that is boycotts, sanctions, divestment, these are perfectly legitimate forms of uh, international relations, international behavior. In, in international relations, we call this coercive diplomacy. They are acceptable forms of nonviolent action. And I assume we prefer nonviolence over the use of force except perhaps depending on who's using the force and against whom. But I would also say that going to the United Nations for recognition, to international bodies appealing to international law are also legitimate, nonviolent forms of action and may be less destructive than violating international law. But my problem with BDS is twofold. My first problem is the rhetoric some of which you have heard. There are three, probably more, but I think that I could identify three types of criticism of Israel. One is, one is anti-Semitism, one is, comes from anti-Zionism, and one is anti-policies of the government. BDS, the present BDS campaign, combines, often combines all three of these or two of these, but my real problem is that the rhetoric challenges Israel's right to exist. This usually comes from Americans, from Europeans, I've heard it also from Arabs, Libyans, Egyptians, not so much from the PLO. And the reason is that the official PLO position has already in 1988, again in 1993, and again recently, recognized Israel's right to exist, those words. Although I might add, Benachem Begin uh, once said that we don't need recognition of our right to exist. We have that historically for over 2,000 years. The second problem that I have with BDS is that it's not helpful. It's counterproductive. And I say this more from the point of view of an academic. Sanctions have a very poor success rate. And I re researched this uh, over the years. It's been claimed that sanctions, BDS in one form or another, worked against South Africa. That's been contested. They may have worked against Burma, uh, maybe Iran recently. 
but they certainly didn't work and haven't worked against Pakistan, against former Yugoslavia, Serbia, North Korea, and the list is long. The, in the research that I've looked at, the best, the highest percentage of success for sanctions has been 25%. Most, most lists, most databases would put it at much lower rate of success. And there are many reasons for the failure of uh, BDS or sanctions. Uh, I won't go into them. I love to have my students make the list. But there is one reason in particular that I think would be relevant here, and that's that there's a tendency, blanket BDS, to create solidarity, to create a rally around the flagpole amongst the public that's under fire from outside. In our case, this would prove Netanyahu correct when he says that everyone is against us. BDS, I think, s speaks to and strengthens our existential fears. It strengthens the manipulation of those fears, and it does so in, the, uh, in a direction that is opposite to what I think those who do want to see an end of the occupation are actually seeking. This is the case, I think, with blanket BDS. I'm not sure it would be the case for selective sanctions. Selective sanctions do tend to have better success rate, particularly when they are taken vis-a-vis -vis individuals who have key economic power. And I think uh, we saw here last year the BDI breaking the impasse movement or campaign. Uh, that may have been a sign that selective sanctions are beginning to hurt some people, possibly the whole issue of sanctions against the products from settlements or businesses doing business in the settlements. This is against those who actually have some power. But I doubt that an academic boycott would have much of the same effect. Uh, frankly, I think there's hardly any point in sanctions against us in academia because we hardly have the power to impact the government in the way that the industrialists can, for example. I think we're the wrong target. Not only because our status and our influence is down, and in fact, we are under fire in a, here in our own country. And uh, a colleague of mine pointed out recently that in the litany of accusations against Israeli government policies by the many academics abroad, in this litany, it's often included the fact that the Israeli government is stifling Israeli universities. And I think it is ironic that the BDS campaign wants to do the same thing. But that's not the reason, in my opinion, that we're the wrong target. We have been under fire here. There's a campaign against us that went all the way to the Knesset by Im Tiltsu, where they actually looked at bibliographies our syllabi in the political science department of the Hebrew University and others, and came up with a figure of like 73% of the items are anti-Zionist. I never quite understood how Aristotle was an anti-Zionist, but these were, this was actually brought to the Knesset, and the Education Committee actually asked for an investigation into the chatranut, or the incitement at Israeli universities. And I'm talking about the politicization of the Malag uh, under, the, under Gidon Saar when he was education minister. Or pressure that takes both, of course, the campaign against Ben-Gurion University's political science department. Or pressure that people do, do experience in classrooms um, and from administrations, not only at Bar Ilan University. And this connection I would say that we're the wrong target because the academic boycott is counterproductive. But the point is not so much who it hurts or who it helps in academia. I think ac academic boycott is counterproductive because it stifles debate and it stifles criticism. The university is based on the principle of academic freedom. And this is not by accident. It is absolutely critical. The whole point of a university is to provide a community in which one can think, exchange, and challenge ideas and opinions. 
not just provide lists of books to read, although even such lists should not be censored or controlled from outside. Democracy is, first of all, based on intellectual freedom, that men and women have the tool of reason. Liberal democracy, the way we know it, grew out of the Protestant Reformation. The idea that the church is not the only possible intermediary between people and God, or the only one that can understand God's will. That people have reason, the ability and the right to think for themselves, to reason, to have a say, if you will, to have a vote. Dictatorships that we've known have tried to take that away. Academic freedom has been a major target for them. The Nazis closed down Charles University. The Soviets put professors in mental institutions in order to gain control, in order to gain conformity, to prevent criticism. And this is, this is why the academic boycott is dangerous. Whether it is Hillel on campuses refusing to permit criticism of Israel, or organizations like the one I was belonging to, I don't know if I'm still a member, the Peace and Justice Studies Association that this summer accepted, voted in BDS, boycott of any academic institution, cooperation in conferences and books or what have you, boycott of any, any academic institution that does not support BDS. I don't teach abroad, so I haven't experienced what most of you who've spoken here have experienced. But I suspect that Hillel will not have me because I'm too critical, too critical of Israel. And now I want to see what my peace studies colleagues abroad will do with me when we have a conference that I've been organizing on behalf of the Tammy Steinmetz Center for Peace Studies at Tel Aviv University holds a joint conference, as I say, that I've been organizing at Brandeis on responsibility to protect. I want to see now if my colleagues will be joining that or not. In any case, in my opinion, nobody, neither Palestinians nor Israelis, benefits from shutting people up or trying to close minds. Thank you.